Very good. We are starting to fill up and I wanna be very respectful of everyone's precious time. Um, we pride ourselves on being very family oriented and, and informal in our college, but this is such an exciting event. You're, you're gonna have to forgive me. I'm gonna get a little formal for a second. Get formal and start off by saying howdy. Howdy. Howdy back. Howdy, howdy back. Howdy. <laughs> howdy. 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 Okay, well, go. howdy, Aggie geoscientists, and welcome to our first career panel event of 2021. My name is Debbie Thomas, and I have the privilege of serving as your dean. Thank you all so much for joining us. And um, please join me first in thanking our exceptionally distinguished panelists and hosts. Um, I'm gonna start off by introducing our host and moderator, and she in turn will introduce our distinguished panelists and, and take over from there. And then I'll pick back up to moderate a Q&A session um, at the end uh, as time allows. So let me uh, introduce to you, Mrs. Jill Urbancar, class of 86. Jill is the chair of the College of Geosciences Advisory Council, and she is the visionary behind this afternoon's amazing event. Jill Urbancar is the executive director of the Consulting Services and Landfolio Solutions team for the Land Administration Solutions Group at Trimble. She works with entities around the world to establish comprehensive, sustainable, and effective land tenure solutions, which leverage technology international best practices and local requirements for the furtherance of secure land rights, transparent land transactions and reliable information systems. Mrs. Irvin Carr graduated in 1986 with a degree in geography from the College of Geosciences here at a and And she leads by example as a former student through her many years of dedicated service in support of our college. Jill, thank you so much. And I, I turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. Super. Well, thanks, Debbie. And you're right. We do. We have a, a super exciting um, discussion plan this afternoon um, with really industry leading um, geoscientists who come from, I think, all walks of the geoscience sector. And so it's my privilege to introduce everybody um, and then get the discussion started, as you said. So um, I'm going to start off with an introduction of Don Wright. Don, you want to wave to everybody? I see you. There she is. Um, and so bear with me, I am going to read these bios because I don't want to miss out on any of the um, factoids and fun, interesting information that they've got about themselves here. So um, after 17 years as a professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State, Dr. Don Wright was appointed chief scientist at Esri, a world leading geographic information system software services and R&D company in October 2011. As chief scientist of Esri, Don works with the CEO on strengthening the scientific foundation for Esri software and services, while also representing Esri to the national international scientific community. She maintains an affiliated faculty appointment with the College of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State. Her research, research interests include geographic information science, ocean informatics and cyber infrastructure, benthic terrain and habitat characterization, and the processing and interpretation of high resolution bathymetry, video, and underwater photographic images. She's authored or co-authored more than 180 articles and 12 books on marine GIS, hydrothermal activity, and tectonics of mid-ocean ridges, and marine data modeling. She's participated in over 20 oceanographic research expeditions worldwide, including 10 legs on the ocean drilling program on the Joides Resolution, three dives on the deep submergence vehicle Alvin, and two dives on the Pisces 5. She holds an individual interdisciplinary PhD in physical geography and marine geology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, a Master of Science in Oceanography from Texas A&M, and a BS cum laude in geology from Wheaton College in Illinois. Um, she was also awarded the Texas A&M Geosciences Innovator Award in 2019. Um, and just as a few personal notes, she, her other interests include road cycling, mountain biking, apricot green tea, gummy bears, 18th century pirates. I suspect Riley's not a puppy anymore, but her golden retriever Riley and SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> 
<laughs> so welcome, Dawn. We're glad to have you this afternoon. All right, next up is Ron Bizio. Ron, you want to wave to everybody for us? How are you? And being from Massachusetts, I still have to work on my howdies, so I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure you get lots of time. Your, so your Ron, accent is much stronger than normal today, Jill. I think it's well, your, I think you know, you're talking to the home crowd. I'm hanging to the crowd. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It comes and goes, you know. But um, so Ron is our senior vice president of geospatial at Trimble. He joined Trimble in 1996 and has had several marketing positions, um, sales and general management roles prior to taking over the global responsibility for surveying in the geospatial business in 2015. He has previously held um, technical and marketing roles at Esri and at Autodesk. He has a master's degree in business administration from the University of Denver, a master's in regional planning from the University of Massachusetts, and an undergraduate degree in geographic information systems and cartography from Salem State University in Salem, Massachusetts. And Ron lives in the Denver area in Colorado. Yes. Boulder, Colorado, just down the hill from the National Center for Atmospheric Research up at the top of the hill there. There we go. Thanks, Ron. Glad you're Thank here. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Thanks for having me. All right. Next up is Carolyn Wilson. Carolyn, give away. Hi. There she is. Howdy. So Carolyn has a bachelor's degree in biology from Austin College and a master's degree in oceanography from Texas A&M University. After completing her undergraduate degree, she spent two years as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Federated States of Micronesia, working as a youth and community development volunteer. After graduate school, she moved to Washington, D.C. to work for two years at the National Science Foundation as a science, oops, sorry, as a science assistant for the geoscience education and diversity, diversity funding programs. For the next seven years, she was a research analyst at the American Geosciences Institute conducting research and development activities on the changing dynamics of the geoscience workforce. For the past year and a half, she's worked at the American Society for Engineering Education as a researcher and program evaluator. She just started a new position as a special projects manager for the Southeastern University's Research Association, managing two major NASA grants, uh, programs. Her career path has been varied within the science and engineering federal and nonprofit sectors so she can speak to the repurposing of skills to the job at hand. While at AGI, she became a recognized expert in the status of geoscience workforce. She currently lives in Alexander, Alexandria, Virginia with her cat, Willow, and lots of snow, apparently. Welcome, Carolyn, glad you're here. And last but not least, Russ. Um, Russ Callender is currently the director of the Washington Sea Grant, located at the University of Washington in Seattle. His career has primarily been in the public service sector, providing executive leadership to major national scientific and operational organizations, where he has applied his experience as an inter interdisciplinary marine scientist, environmental policy expert, and seasoned program administrator. He led progressively more complex scientific organizations supervising up to 1,700 people across the globe. Until 2018, Russell was assistant administrator for NOAA's National Ocean Service, where he transformed the organization by unifying, unifying the senior executive leadership team, streamlining, streamlining program execution, and developing and communicating new program priorities to staff and stakeholders. Prior to this, he was acting assistant administrator and deputy assistant administrator within the National, National Ocean Service. Russ received a doctoral degree in geology at Texas A&M in 1992. Prior to that, he received a master's degree in geology at Stephen F. Austin State University and a bachelor's degree in geology from Stephen F. as well. So welcome, Russ, glad to have you. Thanks. So good. Well, a big howdy and an Aggie welcome to everybody once again. I'm glad to have you here and so, um, we've got some questions that we'd like to put to each of you. And then, as Debbie said, we'll have some time at the end for some um, Q&A from all of the folks who are listening and, and sitting in our discussion today. So, Don, um, we're going to start with you, this first question um, coming to you. And really looking at the workforce as it is today, um, what skills do you think all geoscientists need to have to thrive and lead in today's emerging work? 
Well, thank you, Jill. And uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel uh, with such great colleagues. And I think we're going to run out of time to talk about uh, everything, uh, especially this first question, because we could have a whole session just on this first question. And for me now, the geosciences, when we say geosciences, it's so varied because it could be traditional geology, it could be uh, geographic information science, which is more on the geospatial side uh, in terms of uh, my colleagues at, at Trimble and those of us at Esri. It could be uh, more academic. It could be in the nonprofit sector with conservation organizations. Uh, all of these, uh, it could be government, of course. But I think one of the skills that cuts through all of these, I would say, is to have a digital presence a digital portfolio, because regardless of what, which of these sectors you are going to end up in, if you've got a, a website uh, that shows who you are, what your background is, uh, what you've done, uh, where you're aiming, and if you've got uh, a presence on social media, and we could have, we could uh, debate the merits of that, uh, in my own career, uh, Twitter has been uh, a boon. Uh, there's so many wonderful resources. If you're in the right, the, the lighted, the light spaces uh, of Twitter, not the not the bad, not the dark sides of, of any of these social media platforms. Uh, being able to to show that and to link people to that, uh, a lot of geoscientists are using Instagram to great effect. And I've noticed how the professional organizations all the way from the Geological Society of America, the American Geophysical Union, the Association of American Geographers, uh, we at Esri use social media very heavily uh, and we are on Instagram and showcasing the places where we are working in the field, uh, the maps that we are creating, the data that we're producing, the projects that we're involved in, I would love to talk to Carolyn about her, her work in Micronesia because I've worked in American Samoa and there's we've got uh, quite a bit of a, a web portfolio. I, I now use the word portfolio, digital portfolio uh, to describe some of the things that, that I'm building now in, in my career. But when I was at Oregon State, I, uh, I didn't order my students, but I strongly encouraged them to create this type of web presence, this type of digital portfolio. Uh, and with Esri, we have uh, story maps as a medium now. And we find that a lot of students are creating story maps of their uh, professional and, and their student lives. So they have they've created story maps of where, they've, where they're from, where they've gone to school. They have put their, their class projects, their course projects that they're proud of as part of uh, the story map and uh, other aspects. So they are essentially creating a digital CV. So, so that's one of the things that, that I would highly encourage. Super, thank you very much. Well, um, Ron, turning to you with the same question, um, coming from Trimble, which um, publicly traded large corporation, what, what do you um, see from that seat, if you will, you know, that's, that's really needed to thrive in the, in the, uh, the workforce as students are coming out? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think I'll look at it two ways, maybe one on the technical and one on the more, more ge general. Um, I, I think one of the things that we're really seeing from a technical standpoint is the increased importance of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And especially because if you think about it, and we're part of the problem in many ways, there are just so many sources of data out there, microsatellites, satellite imagery, um, uh, bathymetric data, mobile mapping systems, scanners, all of these um, sources of data generating massive point clouds. But in the end, customers want to use the data to make decisions in their, in their industry and in their domain. So I think it's really important that we are, have got to employ technology to help get from these point clouds to answers. Where this came really home to me was for a few years, I was running Trimble's railway business and we were in presenting to um, one of our customers 
And um, we, our salespeople were talking about the massive point clouds we were going to collect. And midway through the meeting, I'm looking at the customer and I realized he actually only cared if his train was going to hit the wall. Uh, he, you know, in the end, the point cloud was what he needed to get to his answer. So I think anything students can do to learn more techniques to help get from point clouds, geospatial product to answers is going to help out. So that's from on the technical side. More on the, you know, Jill, you mentioned, you know, the big company. Um, what does it take to, to interview well and to, 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 to move up inside an organization? The number one thing that we look for is what we call effective advocacy. And it's essentially presentation skills. Um, I was very fortunate in my graduate program in regional planning. We were, quote unquote, forced every month or so to present in front of all of the other students. And you got very comfortable over time presenting in front of others. And it just that is the most important skill we look for, because you need that whether you're presenting in front of a customer, whether you're trying to present to get your budget approved, or even if you're just trying to get your colleagues to follow you in a, a new development initiative that you want to go after. That effective advocacy is probably one of the most important things from a non-technical, but really, really essential. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate that. Um, Carolyn, to you as well with that question, um, certainly sitting in a very different kind of role um, where you are today. So how does, from your viewpoint, you know, how do you see the, um, the key skills that are really needed in the upcoming workforce? Sure. Um, well, I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I, I think my perspective comes more in in some of the work and research I've done on um, recent graduates and what employers tell uh, tell nonprofits and um, societies and um, academic institutions on what they're looking for uh, amongst uh, potential new hires. And um, the discussion has moved towards looking at looking for new hires that have a general good basis across the board on just about everything. So having a good um, base, basis of knowledge in your area of geosciences, but branching out to other areas of geosciences, having a kind of a base understanding of the general, uh, the general technical uh, area of geosciences, as well as a good basis of professional skills, knowing how to write and knowing how to write to your audience, knowing how to communicate um, uh, to others, knowing how to collaborate together, um, project management, some of those, some of those things that you don't realize that you're gaining in your graduate programs or your undergraduate programs, but you are. Um, and then, and then having what's called a T or a U shape of skills development where you are um, very specialized in a couple of specific areas, but that general knowledge runs across everything. Um, so when so when I was working at AGI, when we talked to um, to uh, newly hired uh, geoscientists after they'd finished their um, their degrees and moved to the workforce, they talked. To, when we asked them what they wished they had known before entering the workforce, a lot of the things that came up were. Um, a mix of technical and professional skills, but mostly those professional skills. But they wanted to have a more applied understanding or a broader understanding of the geosciences because they're um, most employers recognize you're really good at your degree area. And, and so now it's about how can you apply that and how does that fit within the broader scope? And then um, knowing about business skills or uh, personnel management or, um, uh, communications, statistics, writing, things like that. Um, your employer can help you with some of the more technical pieces that come along with your uh, with your job, um, but it's kind of up to you to make sure that you are uh, prepared in some of those professional areas and can hit the ground running and know how to solve the problem that comes up in front of you, or at least know how to troubleshoot as it comes across. And as someone who's been working in and around the nonprofit sector and with uh, societies and with um, multiple different uh, stakeholders, uh, I, I pride myself in becoming a jack of all trouble hearing a jack of all trades kind of person. Sorry, Siri, like on my watch. <laughs> um, and just learning how to figure out what can I do. And so this is for you, learning how to figure out what can you do to solve the problem at hand and how do you put all of those pieces together? Because it's really about 
skills development right now. And that's what employers are looking for. Super. Thanks, Carolyn. So Russ, over to you as um, more of a government or quasi-government entity, if you will, with NOAA and Sea Grant and um, kind of an academic viewpoint as well. What are your sure. thoughts? Well, first of all, the comments from the panelists, I think, were rock solid, really super helpful. Uh, you know, my response, as you say, really comes from the perspective of being a, a geological oceanographer, a coastal scientist, uh, a coastal lab director, as well as uh, an executive leader within NOAA. So it's a little bit different perspective, but I think the fundamentals of what all of the panelists uh, said are, are still very applicable. I think the biggest bit of advice that I can give you is something really simple and straightforward, and that's about effective communication. Being able to um, communicate your technical uh, information in a way that anybody can understand it is going to get you a long ways. I think my best experience learning how to do that was when I was working on my PhD at Texas A&M, I was working on deep sea chemosynthetic communities and how they fossilized. And I was explaining this literally over the fence to my next door neighbor who was an air conditioner repairman, like zero science training. And I got him excited about it. He was excited about oceanography, about chemosynthesis. And, you know, anyway, so being able to talk in such a way that something that's pretty esoteric and technical, people get it's critical. If you move into leadership positions, being able to communicate to your other scientists, great. You probably already have that down. How do you communicate to an administrative professional who might have a high school education? How do you communicate to a senior leader that doesn't have your background? You know, I, I found that, that that experience talking to the air conditioner repairman prepared me really effectively to go talk to Congress. You know, I'm, I'm going and talking to members of Congress. I'm talking to staff, all super bright people. But they might have a degree in history. And so how do you explain uh, coastal flooding and inundation to someone like that? It's just you've got to learn how to communicate. And an outshoot of this is, you know, throughout your career, you're going to be building relationships. You're going to be building networks. Uh, you're going to be building coalitions, and I'll, I'll be happy to talk more about networking and coalition building a little bit later in one of the other questions. But I think just being able to to get your point across in a simple, straightforward way, uh, either through, you know, as Don suggested, uh, you know, with with uh, a digital portfolio, uh, lots of ways to do it, but you've got to be able to communicate. Excellent. Thanks, Russ. So our next question, um, and Ron, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, where do you see the biggest growth area for um, geoscientists or, or graduates with geoscience um, degrees or those that are looking to go into the geoscience career field? Any thoughts? Yeah, so I really liked this question. I think the hardest thing I had with this question was narrowing it down to a couple that I could talk to in my allotted time, uh, because there's just so, you know, you get so excited about our industry and there's so many great areas. Um, coming from the Trimble side, I think I'll hit on just maybe a couple. One is um, the, the movement to autonomy, uh, autonomous vehicles. And everybody um, thinks of when they think of autonomous vehicles as cars and taxis and buses, things like that. What we're actually at Trimble, we're, we, we actually see it happening probably first is in agriculture and construction where you've got a confined space, where you've got less human interaction, perhaps. And so there's, we actually think that in, in agriculture, on farms and in construction sites, you're gonna see a lot of autonomy. And I think there's a big role for the geoscientists in autonomy because in two areas. One, there's gonna to need to be rich spatial data to provide context for all of these vehicles moving around. Um, that's gonna be really important. The, all of a sudden, our data is going to need to be even more precise because real, you know, these are going to be really real-time decisions that are going to be made by vehicles based upon where they are um, in, in the in the landscape. 
Um, the second area of autonomy that's pretty exciting and, and would love to you know, talk about internships and other things in places like Trimble um, is the fact that there's just a wide variety of sensors that are, um, that are out there. LIDAR, GPS, radar, and all of these sensors. You know, if you listen to Elon Musk, he believes that it's going to go, that autonomy is going to go in one direction. Others believe it's going to go in another direction. But, but there's this whole basket of sensor technology that the people are thinking that is, is going to be there. So that's one. And, 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 and I'm, I'm pretty excited about autonomous vehicles. The other one that I'm really excited about um, is the convergence of buildings and the built environment. Um, for many, many years, the building was almost like this Cartesian zero zero uh, structure where everyone thought of the building and it just like it floated out there in ether. And then all of a sudden we started to put the building into the context of the landscape. Um, where are the utilities? Where are the transportation corridors? Where's affordable housing? Where's public transportation stops? All of a sudden the building and the geospatial data around it came together. And I think that's an area that's gonna grow. I think one of the most exciting things I've seen in the industry in years was when Esri and Autodesk decided to collaborate um, and something that Esri coined as geo design. And I think that's a really exciting area to see, um, to see where that's going to go. So those are the two that probably have me the most excited. Jill. Super. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate that. So Carolyn, to you, same question. Um, where do you see the biggest growth areas in the geoscience career space? Well, Ron, Ron definitely stole one of mine. I was going to talk. I was going to mention automation because I think that's huge, and I and I I think it provides so much opportunity for uh, for uh, geosciences and geos and geoscientists to to really um, build and grow and work in our our workforce. But I, I think with the uh, with the growth in recognition of um, of sustainability issues uh, here in the United States, I think there's going to be more connection with um, social sciences within within the workforce than maybe there hasn't been before. And I think this is really exciting, like really recognizing the connection of the geoscience world and the workforce with how that affects uh, the public on a day to day basis and moving forward. And I think um, I think the development of innovation in those areas uh, to help help us in our daily lives um, and help the help the public and connect that with policymaking is really exciting to me. Do you have any examples of that oh. where you know that's going on? Uh, no, <laughs> not not <laughs> specifically. Um, mostly because I'm not really in the geo the 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 geo workforce as strongly as I have been um, in the past. But um, it's really exciting here in DC. It's really exciting to see the uh, the nonprofit world really work in in that space, um, particularly when they're advocating to. Um, to federal agencies and to Congress on on what on, on what their constituency um, is doing um, in their research world and how that will affect the public in, in general. And there's been a lot of federal funding that's been focused on the connection between geoscience and social science um, moving forward. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, okay, Russ, to you. And um, same question: Where, What do you see as the biggest growth area for geoscience careers? Sure. So I'm, again, coming from that perspective of being a federal scientist in NOAA, and I think um, there's going to be a continued and growing emphasis on climate change and assessment, mitigation, adaptation, and the broad topic of resilience. And I'm, I'm thinking in the coastal zone, but also broadly across uh, the continental U.S. as well. And and to be clear, this isn't a political calculus with the new administration coming in. I think this is, it has to be a policy emphasis because of the changes that we're seeing. If you just sort of step back and think from the coastal zone, for example, about 40% of the U.S. population lives in coastal shoreline counties. Um, you know, they're at risk from larger storms, more intense storms with a warming planet. You've got more moisture to be dropped. Think about uh, Hurricane Harvey and the impacts it's had uh, there in Texas. So, um, as and as you as you think of the challenges that are coming to the coast, um, you know there's uneven enforcement of building codes, of local ordinances, of poor planning and construction. What Ron mentioned about putting buildings in the context of the landscape is right on. I think that's going to be 
a major focus uh, in the coastal zone in particular. And you know, related to this is there's there's industries that you probably haven't thought about partnering with, such as the insurance or the reinsurance industries. They're some of the biggest companies on the planet, and they're going to be looking uh, and needing. They produce. I love this term. Uh, cat models, catastrophic models, you know, what's, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And so they're looking for data about water levels, about tides, about currents, about um, subsidence. Um, and, you know, they're going to be a big consumer of a lot of geoscience related data. And they're doing some really innovative things. Uh, just one quick example, and I'll stop. There is a, a coral reef area in the Yucatan in Mexico that's, uh, now becoming insured due to a coalition of resort owners. And they developed essentially a parametric kind of model that when you, certain conditions are reached, um, this triggers this insurance policy and Hurricane Delta actually met some of those criteria and then allowed additional uh, funding to come in quickly for, uh, for cleanup, for hazard assessment, for uh, restoration. And so, you get these connections between the geoscience side and other industries that you may not have thought about. But I think that larger coastal resilience kind of question is going to be a big deal. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. I appreciate that. All right. So our next question from our panel is, oh, um, could I, uh, oh sorry, Don, I totally forgot you. Sorry. I'm desperate to chime in here because. No, no, please do. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's great. This is such a, a great answers from my colleagues. And so I want to agree with, with all of them and to what uh, Russ was just uh, expressing in terms of uh, the geosciences collaborating with the insurance and reinsurance uh, industry. That is huge also with uh, floodplain uh, managers, state and local government. And I put into the chat uh, a conference that's coming up next week uh, that students uh, and faculty and staff can all uh, touch base on. It's the uh, NOAA Coastal Geotools Conference. I don't know if anyone has heard of this conference, but it's, uh, it speaks to many of the issues that, that Russ has just uh, shown to you. There will likely be quite a few NOAA Sea Grant people there there will be uh, coastal uh, floodplain managers, uh, a lot of people from the, the local and state sectors in terms of the uh, federal sector as well, a lot of geoscientists, especially coastal geomorphologists. And the conference is actually organized around the creation and the production of apps uh, and tools. The, 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 and this, I think, is a big growth area, this idea of product engineering. Uh, from the Esri side, maybe from the Trimble side as well, we uh, of course are known uh, at Esri for creating software. We develop software that for us is called product development. Uh, but there is product engineering that is one step further. And in product engineering, you're getting at actually some of the communication and translation that Carolyn was talking about. Certainly what, what Ron was talking about and Russ was talking about as well can you create uh, an actual tool or, or an app for a mobile phone or for, for the web or for a tablet that actually helps a community to uh, monitor their water quality or monitor sea level rise or be uh, adaptive uh, to the various uh, ravages of, of climate change? And you don't have to be a full-on computer scientist to do this. There are many, many geoscientists who are becoming expert uh, in, the, in these areas, especially as the technology has gotten to be uh, easier to use so that you can develop these things on your own so that you can teach others. Uh, so this, this is absolutely huge. So I would encourage uh, people to look into, into that area and look into the Coastal Geotools uh, Conference and it will be uh, virtual. Geodesign, Ron, you hit the home run there with, with starting off talking about geodesign, Carolyn as well. That is another huge uh, area of growth. And uh, I'm going to put something else in the chat. I hope these are getting through. Uh, geodesign uh, is an area that is very close to uh, building information management and urban planning uh, that Ron talked about. And 
uh, Esri does have a wonderful collaboration with, with Autodesk toward that end. But it also stretches over to what Carolyn was talking about in terms of bringing, uh, geodesign is really a bridge uh, between the physical, the social sciences, uh, the, the arts. Uh, it incorporates not only urban planning, but landscape architecture, archeology, span anthropology, graphic design, uh, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, geo, the, it, it's geo because the geosciences is absolutely fundamental to it. So there are a lot of geoscientists who are involved in geodesign and it has an ethic where you are actually, you are participating in redesigning physical spaces so that they are more in tune with nature, so that they respect uh, the, uh, the physics, so to speak, of how the landscape was meant to be. And it ultimately uh, results in uh, better city plans. Uh, it, it's involved in creating new parks, uh, new protected areas. Geodesign is big in the ocean in terms of marine protected area planning, marine reserves. It's huge, of course, for coastal areas. And another uh, trend that students should look out for is this idea of digital twin. If you haven't heard of digital twins, this is more than just creating a three-dimensional uh, visualization of an area. A digital twin is actually a functioning, talk about uh, automation, it's a functioning uh, representation of a space uh, where you can create scenarios. Many of us from uh, the 80s, we were so in love with the video game Sim City. You were creating a simulation. <laughs> so now with digital twins, we can, we can totally do that. And we can do that using gaming engines. So along with digital twins, uh, look into serious gaming. And there's a lot of that that is being incorporated into the tools that geoscientists use. Uh, for us at Esri, if you're familiar with City Engine, that's that's what that is for, uh, especially in urban places. And it doesn't hurt that City Engine was used in movies like Big Hero 6 and Zootopia and uh, there are other uh, great movies that are coming that are using our software that I won't divulge at this time. <laughs> but those are some cool. great trends. So just a quick follow up then to you, Don and, and Ron, maybe you want to jump in here too. Um, are you seeing the the idea, the concept of this of geo design? Um, obviously, it's it's getting a lot of play and attention, so to speak, um, in the U.S. But what about in the international space? Are we seeing other uh, markets? Um, obviously, maybe in the Western sec, the uh, Western European areas, et cetera. But what about in um, you know emerging economies and um, maybe? Um, other regions of, of the world? Is it being embraced broadly or is it really a US initiative at this time? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, which I can answer from the academic standpoint and then I'll pass over to Ron. One of the things that occurs at the uh, Geodesign Summit is uh, a side meeting of the international geodesign collaboration among colleges and universities around the world. And they've actually just uh, done a book uh, about geodesign applied in many, many different countries. I think there are about a hundred different countries and universities that were involved in this initial geodesign collaboration. Uh, it's spearheaded by uh, Harvard because the idea of geodesign was actually, is actually being credited to Carl Steinitz, who uh, is a professor at Harvard, who uh, was one of Jack Dangerman's professors when he was at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So, so there's that academic tie, but uh, that is one of the reasons for this geodesign summit uh, that is being hosted. Uh, it's, it's a yearly meeting and there is quite an international audience. We expect it to be even more international because it's virtual this year. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, who uh, participates uh, indeed because it's virtual for the first time this year because of the pandemic. Ron? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Don. Um, and to a point that Don made, you know, she was talking about building information modeling or BIM. Um, 
And um, you know, you were asking the question of you know outside of the United States. Actually, quite frankly, there's a lot of countries outside the United States that I would consider to be leaders in in BIM implementation. I mean, you look at Germany, um, you look at like United Kingdom. There are there are now mandates that when a new major new construction project is underway, that um, the BIM models are part of the deliverables for that. And Jill, you could, I'm actually gonna put it back to you, Jill, you could probably even talk more about the emerging markets because you probably have more passport stamps than anybody on this call to get, uh, maybe even combined. Um, so, you know, what do you see, Jill, in the, in the emerging markets? Yeah, I would say that um, a lot of the, the universities actually in, in some of the emerging uh, markets are really putting a big focus on this because they want their graduates to come out and not um, really be looking at things if you will, through the old methods, but embracing the new technology so that not only are they able to bring better results to their countries themselves, but that makes them more marketable to international firms. And um, if their students are successful abroad, they typically come home and then bring that knowledge and that expertise with them. And so, um, so yeah, I would say in many ways, they readily embrace the technology. They don't necessarily have as robust probably of programs and technologies at hand that we do. But um, but yes, I would say that they're really trying to leapfrog forward and leverage the new technologies, not just in BIM, but in a lot of the uh, the geodesign space as well. Great. And you thought you were going to get away with moderating. I, know, I was hoping, but oh well, it's all good. All righty. Well, thanks, guys. Um, right. So third question that we have, um, and Carolyn, I'm going to call on you first if you don't mind. Um, what opportunity do you wish you had pursued during your education? Yeah, um, so I, I had to think about this one for a bit. Um, but I think I think the, the biggest thing is I wish I had um, pursued some some side instruction on um, on some applied coding, advanced coding techniques, I've had to teach myself how to do that um, as I've entered the workforce, and uh, and I've been it's been okay, but um, it, there was a bit of a learning curve there. So I wish I had had um, had had gone into that and really considered um, instruction in um, some apply, applied advanced statistics. Um, I also picked up a whole bunch of advanced statistics um, when I was uh, when I was working on a doctorate degree that I ultimately didn't finish, but, uh, and then that, that instruction turned out to be some of the best, um, uh, best courses that I took during that doctoral program that have really stuck with me. And I kind of wish I had done that earlier. Um, and it would have, um, uh, would have been a whole, it would have totally helped everything. But I think those are the two areas where I wish I had while I was at A&M had kind of, um, worked, worked more towards those areas. Yeah. Yeah. Super, thanks. Russ, what about you? This is a hard question. Um, I think for me, I wish I would have made a better decision about getting into graduate school and was wish I had been more thoughtful about it. Uh, I had a, an opportunity to get a research assistantship to start a PhD program at a, uh, a university I won't name up in the Rocky Mountains. And I, I chose to go there for the recreational opportunities more so than thinking about what do I want to do like as a real person and in an academic career and in a professional career. And it was a horrible situation. I was treated more like a, a low level lab tech than a collaborator. Uh, I didn't have an opportunity to get on papers, to get on grants. Uh, and what I ended up doing was going into the literature and reading about some of the science that truly interested me and trying to figure out who were the best ones in the country working on what excited me. And those individuals were at, at Texas A&M, and this was in paleoecology, the, the general field, and seeing that they had a ton of publications, they had a lot of multi-authors on those publications. Many of those publications were done by their students or their postdocs, and they also had money. So I showed up at a and I didn't have a research assistantship. I wasn't connected uh, to any kind of uh, funding. And within two weeks, I was able to connect with this research group with these two different professors that I'd read so much about um, and was able to 
be working on you know large grant proposals. I had more. I was a geology student, and I had more submersible and ship time than any of the oceanography students. It was just an amazing experience. Lots of first uh, author publications that I never would have gotten um, except by being more strategic my second time around trying to get into graduate school. Mm, yeah, good point. Good point. Don, what about you? This is a hard question for me as well because I'm so old, you know, when I, <laughs> when I was in graduate okay, school. No. Well, I'm sorry, Jill, I mean, we're, we're both class of 86, but <laughs> I, know, I was a graduate student coming out in 86, <laughs> so I'm still old, but uh, everything was so different back then. And there are so many, I mean, there was no internet really <laughs> back then. <laughs> so, uh, so what do you say? But uh, I, what, what I, having thought about this though, uh, a little bit in, in all seriousness, uh, uh, for me, when I have uh, advised students and I uh, uh, still have the opportunity to do that from Esri, it, the internship is the big one. It is the, it is the singular uh, transformative experience uh, Russ has talked about going out to see, in, in a way, some things are internships that we don't realize are internships. If we're working in a professor's lab, or if we do have a chance to go out in the field, that is an internship. And for me, I didn't realize that I was stepping into the best internship absolutely possible after getting my master degree at, uh, at uh, Texas A&M and then going to work as a marine technician for ODP, uh, what was then the ocean drilling program. Uh, but now, uh, especially if you are in geospatial uh, or if you, you, you're in that broader industry that incorporates uh, Esri and Trimble and, and uh, those technology companies, I can't say enough about uh, the power uh, of an internship and how, uh, how many of them are out there uh, and many of them are paid and many of them are uh, entryways into, into that company. So for interest, for, for, in, for instance, for us at, at Esri, our internship program is getting more competitive, but for the interns that get into our program, we are hiring about 40% of them. So if you are looking for, for that pathway uh, into that industry or into that company, uh, that can be uh, extremely, uh, helpful and don't give up to if you don't get an internship that you want uh, the, the first year or the first summer uh, keep trying and be persistent and keep your your portfolio uh, current uh, so that that you can you can be in there for for the next opportunity thanks Don Ron what about you any wish I had Oh, yeah. So if I get to do it over again. So um, I have some stuff I wrote down and then I changed my answer after listening to Dawn's intro um, because I, I'd go back and study oceanography because uh, I grew up outside the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And uh, if I, I can remember getting so excited when the NOAA ships would come into port and getting to see Alvin as a kid was a, was a big moment. So um, so if I could go back, I'd, I'd change my major and I may even talk to my wife about another degree. So the, the two things that, that, that I think are really important, no, number one, get your passport and get out of the country. Study abroad, do anything you can to get overseas. Um, I had an opportunity when I was in um, graduate school to teach a two week GIS seminar at the Universidad de Aveiro in Portugal. And I got bit by the bug hard. Um, I've now been to 40 plus countries for Trimble. And I just, I love that aspect of it. Um, get outside the country and, and experience that. See how professionals use our tools in other, in other parts of the world. Um, I think it's a great thing. The second thing is maybe a little bit of a curveball. Um, if you get a chance, study some law. Um, it's actually interesting. When I was in, when I was in planning school, I took a coast, uh, coastal law class and then actually decided that I almost went to law school and decided to go down that path. Um, but even the exposure that I had to, to legal classes have been so helpful because the geosciences industry is actually dealing with a lot of thorny legal issues right now. There's some very serious data privacy issues that are coming down. Autonomy is gonna have a lot of um, legal issues associated with it. So anything you can do to get exposed to that, I think will, uh, will always benefit. 
And um, to Dawn's point, number two after study abroad for me would be internship. If you can do, if you can do both of them at the same time, all the better. So. Great, thanks. And of course, you know, I agree with the get out of town, get out of the country, go take a look around, see what everybody else is doing, see what you can learn, maybe through a different um, lens and a different viewpoint. So good, thanks. Right, so we're down to our last question. Debbie, are we good? Do we have till the bottom of the hour, the half hour? Or do we have to stop at the top of the hour? Some may need to leave at the top of the hour. If if you're able to stay, we can continue the Q&A, but um, it, it, why, don't you, why, don't, why don't we do a quick wrap up with the last question and, and, then, okay. and then- Yeah, I don't think it'll take too long. So, okay. So last question, Russ, you get to go first. Um, what's the best advice you ever received? Um, relevant, obviously, to what we're talking about here today, um, as opposed to maybe, you know, Super Bowl picks or something. I never got the Super Bowl picks, so I can't really help that on that one. I, I, I'm going to hit three things really quickly here uh, to be cognizant of time is one is networking. Uh, every job that I've ever gotten, except for probably my first one, was based on networking by uh, building a brand for myself, by building a reputation, by building connections, by figuring out how to work well with other people so that uh, individuals would go, wow, we want to get this guy. And so literally almost every job I've ever had is through networking. Um, secondly, be willing to take risks in your career. Uh, I've been a risk taker both in my personal and professional life. I'm a have, was a rock climber and mountaineer for many, many years. Uh, and I've, you know, I took a lot of risks in jobs. I, I uh, had an opportunity uh, to run one of the coastal science labs in NOAA. And then I ended up running all of the coastal science labs in NOAA because, you know, individuals saw that I could, that I had those leadership qualities. Uh, and it was a big risk for me to do that because running a, you know, a single lab was so much fun. I was a NOAA science diver. I got to get out in the field, et cetera. Um, and I guess the, the other, the last thing is find a mentor. Find somebody that is willing to invest in you and um, build that relationship with them. And I would also say, don't just find a mentor, but be a mentor as well. I've found that most of the, the, the most rewarding opportunities and experiences I've had as a leader was helping other people grow and develop in their careers. It's just so exciting to me. So networking, be willing to take risks and focus on mentoring. Super. I could Thanks, talk Russ. for a long time on any of those. <laughs> no, right? <laughs> Don, what about you? What was the best advice you ever received or that you might want to give out? Another tough question, uh, but I'll, I'll just say quickly, uh, my major professor for my PhD uh, said that you need to ask questions. You need to always be asking questions. And up to that point, I had not really gotten that at all. I hadn't gotten that as a scientist in terms of posing a scientific question. And I hadn't gotten it as a professional in, in terms of, of, uh, of course, the scientific curiosity is there, but having the confidence to ask questions, I think was, was the big piece of advice. And we, we recently hired a young lady at Esri who impressed us uh, in her interview because she asked us a lot of questions. She asked us about our company culture. Uh, she asked questions uh, about the position that she was uh, applying for. She didn't just try to sell herself. Uh, and of course, with these interviews and these opportunities, they are getting more competitive. And she totally set herself apart because of that one factor. So I would say, don't be afraid to get into the habit of not only having questions in your mind, but articulating uh, questions and having the courage to ask them. Thank you, Dawn. Ron, not you. Yeah, so a couple of things. Um, you know, I never thought I'd find myself at a, you know, S&P 500 company in a business role. And, and it's interesting. So 
I also never thought I would find myself doing an MBA. And, pe- and I get a lot of people coming up in Tremble asking me, well, where should I go for an MBA? What should I do? And, and my point is, what is it you want to know? What is it, where, is your, where do you feel like the gaps are in your experience? Do you want to know more about marketing? Do you want to know more about finance? There are different programs. There are different kinds of places to go. And the other thing is, uh, we get people who come into the company, and two years after, after joining the company, they want to go off and get a, a business degree. And we say, well, you don't even really know yet what you don't know. Um, give yourself some time um, to find out, find those things out and, and then ask those questions. And so that's one thing. And then the other thing, the last thing I'd leave you with is um, I think um, I would actually encourage people because I've received this advice is find a way to give back because it's really rewarding. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually on the board of directors for a, a nonprofit um, and they, um, they teach children how to, te- uh, uh, how to, uh, how to sail and they need my business skills and I enjoy being around their great environment and they are much more patient with other people's children than I could be. Um, and so I love, I love being around them and I get so much energy from being around them. So I, I would definitely leave time for yourself and figure out a way to give back because it's really rewarding. Well, and that's very aggy of you to say that. Well, I just want to that. So thanks. All right, Carolyn, last but not least. Yeah, um, I think my biggest one is be your own advocate in everything. Um, Ask for opportunities. If something arises that you want to be a part of, ask and see if you can do it. Um, Create opportunities that um, will help you grow and give you challenge and um, take on some of those risks that were discussed earlier. Um, And know know when to say yes and when to say no. Um, I mean, I I have said yes much more often than I've said no, but knowing your limits is also incredibly important too. Um, But in every job that I've had, it's always been about knowing knowing my skills and knowing what I can do and where I can best fit into the project and being able to articulate that effectively to um, to my boss, to my teammates, to um, the uh, the individuals that I am working with at other organizations, like know how you can fit in and how and how you can work with your team and find ways to challenge and, and grow. Right on. Thanks, Carolyn. Wow. Well, thanks, guys. This was really rich. Um, and I think we've gotten a lot of good input and ideas and perspectives. So, Debbie, um, I hand the baton back to you to throw out some Q&A to our panel. Well, thank you. And panelists, if you need to depart at four, because I know your schedules are incredibly busy, but if, if you can stay, I'd love uh, the opportunity to open up the audience uh, to the participants to any questions. I. Um, either ask them in the chat or raise your little zoomy hand um, and uh, love to hear a follow-up conversation about all of this great advice and, and other questions you might have. I have a question if I could start. Absolutely. Perfect. I don't know where the hand is, so I'm just going to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am actually locationally near the um, Esri in Colorado, do they um, ever have the opportunity to kind of uh, have someone come in and take a look around and just kind of pick the brains of those who are there and kind of give the, you know, uh, their interpretation of how they do what they do effectively? Sure. Yes. The, uh, we, we call that, that office, the, the Denver office, even though it's not technically in, uh, in Denver, uh, it's just outside of Denver, but at any rate, yes, uh, you could you could go over there and uh, ask to be shown around, or there are some wonderful people in that office who can come out and speak to to your organization or who would connect with you. One of them is Joseph Kursky. Uh, Joseph Kursky, uh, Jay Kursky, I'll put it in the chat. He is one of our best uh, ambassadors for Esri on many, many counts. He is a geologist and a geographer by training. He worked for many years at the US Geological Survey and the Census Bureau before coming to us at Esri. And uh, he, uh, I think he would be one of the best people to start with out of, out of that regional office. And if I could just build on Don's comment, you know, if you want to fill up a day, you could go to the other side of the Rocky Mountain Airport where the Trimble headquarters is, and um, we could actually do both both in a day or something like that. If you wanted to put together a group of people, 
we'd love to have you come in. Um, we can show you railway track surveying and we've got an autonomous uh, tractor behind the building we can show. So that maybe we could actually, if you get a group of students together from Texas A&M, we'd happy, be happy to have you guys in with the caveat of once we're back in the office and I can finally get out of this room that I've been in for yeah. <laughs> 11 months. Yes, I would be curious to know how many of um, the master's students are in uh, Colorado. I live there. So um, we do have a couple of our geospatial people. We've had a lot of reorgs that have really thinned it out, but I'm sure that the two of them would love to, to definitely see some of those things as well. And since I'm close to my um, capstone, I'm really trying to get an understanding of just how, how large a project can get because of just how much you can do with the geospatial. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I've got a running list of people with hands up or have, or have raised their hand in the chat. And so first on my list is Aubrey, Aubrey Robbins. Oh my gosh, so much pressure. Okay, I'm excited, but I'm, I'm gonna do this. My question is very simple. From following this conference, I get the impression, it doesn't matter what I study in particular, from oceanography to geology to atmospheric science, as long as I'm learning, even if it's technology, as long as I'm learning, I will be more prepared for real work. Is that correct? Anyone want to comment? I, I would say so. I would, uh, there are so many colleagues and friends that I have who have reinvented themselves mm -hmm. uh, and they've gone into different careers. There's as many of those colleagues as there are those who studied uh, to be um, a metamorphic petrologist and continue on that way all the way through their career and were fantastic at that. So uh, in both cases though, the uh, ability would, to learn is, is, is paramount. Yeah, go Russ. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry Don. So uh, yeah, for me, graduate school taught me how to think. It taught me how to learn. Um, you know, and if you think about an invertebrate paleontologist leading a major uh, federal oceanographic uh, organization, like who would have known? I, you know, but it taught me how to learn. It taught me how to think critically. It taught me really how to um, think big and dream. Carolyn, okay. did you did you want to add anything before I jump in? Do want to Sorry, go on. ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so Aubrey, you're, you're right on it. I asked our CEO, Steve Berglund, one time what he thought was the most important skill that anyone could have in the company. And he said what he looked for more than anything was curiosity. And, 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 you know, and, and if you're curious about something, you can, you can do anything because then, and that just goes hand in hand with, if you're curious about something, you'll, you'll enjoy learning about it. It won't be a chore. Um, and so if I could just teach my 15-year-old, that would be great. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Carolyn, did you want yeah, to add anything? I, I think they covered it. I mean, it's kind of how, what I hit upon in my opening statement. So, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Okay. okay um, next on the list, I have Annie Lee. Hello. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Um, yeah. So, Aubrey, actually, this kind of goes into what you're saying, too, is I've been a mechanical engineer for the last 10 years, and I'm now jumping into this geosciences world. And um, I realized, you know, I wasn't finding fulfillment in the stuff I was working on. And honestly, my passion is the ocean. And I want to <laughs> I want to move into that so bad. Um, but what I've found is that you kind of need to know a lot of programming, it seems like. Every job application I've looked at for GIS analyst or GIS type roles, it seems to be, oh, well, you got to have some kind of programming knowledge. And as a mechanical engineer, I really haven't had to do that. So I'm actually taking my first Python class and I'm going crazy. <laughs> but that's what I've heard a lot of, you know, Python, Python, Python. But then I look at all these job applications and they call out C++, uh, or sorry, yeah, C sharp, uh, several other things. And I just, I'm curious, should I be doing anything in parallel besides Python? I, I would say uh, yes. Uh, uh, Python is huge uh, right now. 
it's the uh, scripting language du jour. And I make a distinction between scripting language and something that's harder core uh, programming language like uh, C Sharp. Uh, JavaScript is also uh, another big one. But there, it, it, this is the idea now though of uh, creating products from all of these different types uh, of scripting languages. And there's some really good uh, courses, uh, MOOCs, are you guys familiar with the massively open online courses? Well, what a great way to supplement the fantastic education that you're getting at Texas A&M. Uh, but, but we at Esri, for instance, offer a MOOC on creating these types of, of apps uh, with Python and, and JavaScript and, and others. And you get uh, a nice little uh, uh, appetizer plate uh, of that. And it's a great way to, to get introduced to that without being, without driving yourself crazy in a hardcore uh, programming or scripting class. So that, that's what I would, that's what I would offer. Yeah, I think, well, I think if you can introduce yourself to others, it's going to be helpful for you. Absolutely. And I think there's, I think there's, some, but I do think there's some underlying logic that's there across the board. So, um, so it gets a little bit easier to pick up a new language um, if you've already kind of understand you kind of understand the basic uh, logic model that is there for for scripting and for coding. Um, I, to add on to that, if you're thinking of heading into the nonprofit sector, really get comfortable with open source um, programs mm -hmm. and know what's out there in the open source world because you're going to be working with very limited budgets. Got it. That's actually yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, Don Hood. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, y'all, for the great uh, answers thus far. My question's, I think, a little simpler, um, you know, especially with the pandemic and everything. And for Esri and Trumbull, which are big, I imagine, sort of culture setting companies, uh, how is remote work and the opportunity for remote work changing? in the professional or industry side of geosciences? Is that becoming something that more companies are looking for or allowing? Well, here, I, I can, I'll start this time. So um, for us, I think it's been a great equalizer. Um, I'm, I'm very envious of Esri because we don't have a core headquarters. Um, my sector of Trimble, we've got about 1,600 people scattered across 23 offices around the globe. But what's great about, about remote work is we're all equal. When we all join into a call, it doesn't matter if somebody's in Finland or New Zealand or where they are in the world. It, whereas other times people would feel left out because they weren't in the Colorado office. They would feel like they weren't really part of the call. So I think it's been a kind of a, a great equalizer. Um, I've enjoyed aspects of it, but boy, I, would, I really do want to get back out and start seeing customers and, and, uh, and visiting our, our development offices around the globe. And I can't even imagine what Jill's doing with herself. <laughs> yeah, it's the same way for us. We are we have found at Esri, uh, and, and we do have a headquarters with around 2,000 people here in Redlands, but we have all of these regional offices, uh, such as the, uh, the Colorado regional office, and all of us are on lockdown. All of us, pretty much all of us are finding that even though we really look forward to getting back into the office and rubbing elbows and shoulders with, with our colleagues, we have been extremely productive uh, in the remote work mode. And it is going to change the way that we work uh, in this company. Uh, I can say that from the director's standpoint uh, uh, because I'm on the, the board of directors of the company that is guiding this company in addition to, to being the, the chief scientist. We are going to, we, we are going to now have these hybrid uh, job positions uh, and we are going to be, it has forced us to be more cognizant of uh, people's uh, life needs uh, people with educating children at home, uh, taking care of elderly parents, uh, just trying to be more productive. We have one uh, colleague who even before the pandemic, he asked to uh, if he could work from his home, which is in the remote woods of Michigan, uh, where he could also spend time uh, wood crafting and hiking and spending quality time with his children. He is one of our most productive 
uh, cartographers. He does this amazing work and it's because of his work situation. He does not have an Esri headquarters that he reports to or even an Esri regional office. He works out of his home and that is his, his mode of productivity. So it, it is going to be a, a new world from that standpoint. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, at least, you know, working at the university and then working in a program that is built on uh, conducting outreach with people in the community. You know, we've we've had to innovate almost everything that we do and how we do it. And so I, I frankly have seen the pandemic as that opportunity to innovate. Uh, and I suspect, as, as Dawn has, has stated very eloquently, that the workforce post-pandemic and the workplace is going to be very, very different uh, for almost all of us. Yeah, agree with all of that. It <laughs> Good, thank you. Allison, Allison Blanchard. Okay, cool. So um, I am actually in my final semester of geosciences. My, my official degree is environmental geoscience with a specialty in biosphere. And I already have two associates, um, one in geology and one in anthropology. And Debbie, um, I actually remember when you were interim dean and like you were in my like um, freshman court, like the, the intro like fresh fish camp thing. So like, it's really cool to see you like actually like dean like officially, so congratulations on that. Um, and actually Russell, I applied to your Sea Grant um, initiative uh, preemptively a few years ago, actually. Um, Obviously I wasn't qualified quite yet, but um, it's really cool to see you guys here. But I was just really wondering, um, what are you looking for in somebody that you are hiring entry level? Like they don't really have much experience um, and like they just, they don't want to be, like I'm not a policy person. That's not really kind of what I want to do. I want to be more into um, um, like field work and um, environmental diagnostics for conservation efforts. Um, and so like, I was just wondering what y'all would say about that. I'll, I'll be happy to start. Uh, I think somebody earlier, uh, I think it was Don talked about internships, you know, as, as a way to kind of get your foot in the door. So internships, fellowships are huge because it would give you the chance to uh, build a connection, start to network, start to get some professional accomplishments, and try a, a variety of places out. Another uh, kind of tactical thing to do is, uh, you know, ask for uh, informational interviews. If you're looking uh, to connect with a company or with, um, you know, an individual that you want to connect with, see if you can find the time, if, if they'll agree, to sit down and talk with you and give you some suggestions and advice uh, and ideas. And again, it's, you know, it's, it's about building that network, but it's also about, you know, putting yourself out there and uh, letting people see who you are and what you can bring. And so my idea with what you just said would be something like putting a face to the name, like um, just like seeing if y'all, like if that's really what you wanna do or like if, you, if like y'all would work well together. Um, as far as the informational interview goes? Yeah, I, I would, you know, be bold. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is somebody's going to say no. Uh, okay. You know, uh, you know, why don't you reach out to uh, Dean Thomas and say, hey, could I sit down and talk to you for a little while and get a better sense of how you got to where you were in your career? Not to put you on the spot there, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> there. The invitation is open to everyone. I would love to hear from you. Okay. And, and I, I'm going to put my email in the chat. I'd be happy to talk to anybody on the call, uh, give you suggestions, ideas, uh, if that'll help. Thank you. Anyone else want to? I think an, I think an internship is a great first step for this kind of um, for this kind of investigation. Um, I, I would say start start making contacts and, and doing some searches through um, through some of the the larger geoscience societies look at um, look at the geological society of America look at the American geophysical Union um, 
uh, those uh, two societies in particular have a lot of um, student opportunities that are listed there um, for both um, recent recent graduates, current students, both the undergraduate and graduate level. And um, it will it will give you a very solid introduction on um, the different aspects of the geoscience workforce and just kind of give you some experience. And it helps you develop that network when you when you start when you start looking at some of the uh, society opportunities. You said Geological Society of America, and what was the other one? Uh, the Geophysical uh, American Geophysical Union. And um, to get some background information about uh, what like what's out there in the geoscience workforce, what kind of occupations exist, uh, check out the American Geosciences Institute. There are a wealth of information on um, career opportunities. They won't necessarily list out internships and like uh, current opportunities, but they, they list out ideas of what is there, um, what your starting salary could be in various different industries, um, to various aspects of the workforce in general. And uh, there's some uh, a lot of information up on that website. And then going back to what Russell said, just probably ask for like an informational interview and just see if they respond. Okay, thank you. Very good. I, um, I have three more, I see three more hands up. So I think that'll be a perfect way to round out the conversation. So first, uh, Van. Yes, I think it's awesome what y'all are doing here in this meeting. Um, I found it great. You'll have all good information that I can use. I've been in college for several years now. I had to go to junior college to get started, but um, many students go that route. Um, <laughs> I was one of them. Um, I graduated from junior college in 2019 and transferred to A&M um, the, the following fall. And ever since then, I've just fallen in love, more and more in love with geology and um, I was with the oceanography department and we went to Galveston Bay and looked at different things in the bay. We got um, sediments, looked at sediments, salinity of the water and everything. It was it was an awesome experience. Dolphins were there. It was it was great. Um, and then we went to San Marcos with the geological um, group of people. And we went to a river, I forget the name of the river, probably San Marcos River or something. And we went and walked on the river and we saw different things in the ground and, and all the different organisms and fossils that were there. I thought that was astonishing. Um, I'll never forget those experiences there at the geosciences, the College of Geosciences at A&M. But what I was getting at is I was looking at Trimble the other day, I stumbled upon Trimble. I don't know other than the fact that they make GPS systems. That's really all that I know about Trimble. What other things do y'all do besides make GPSs? Yeah, so so I'll, I'll be really quick on, on reply. And if you wanna connect on LinkedIn, I'm happy to walk through and, and talk through other things we do. We take GPS in, into agriculture, into construction, but we've branched out into um, working in, uh, we acquired SketchUp from Google. So we're in the design space now for software. So we're in a whole bunch of new areas, but I would say a lot of it is around positioning technology and helping transform the way uh, these industries work, such as agriculture, construction, oil and gas, and others. So, but again, happy to happy to dig deeper on that one if you wanna contact me uh, on LinkedIn. Do you have an email by chance? I'll drop it into the uh, chat. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot and glad, you, glad, glad to hear about your positive experiences. Thank you, Dan. Kashmir. Yeah, it's been amazing at him for sure. Hi, um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so I have an internship. I already got an internship um, two years ago with Department of Homeland Security, Office of Emergency Management, uh, doing FEMA work for GIS. And I did a year of gas. Now I'm in an electrical telecommunications company as a GIS specialist. But um, so I guess I'm in the root of ocean data science uh, for my geoscience masters. Um, I have heard different things from different professors at Texas A&M and uh, of course I've done my own research and things like that but in the NOAA uh, field um, I was told that uh, GIS 
wasn't like a a departmental thing, I guess. Um, I was wondering if, like, how, because I know LIDAR is used. I know that you guys use that quite a bit. But is in the NOAA field, um, since I'm looking more into the oceanography, green data science, and things like that, uh, is there, like, an actual, like, uh, GIS uh, use for it, I guess. Um. <laughs> so, so Kashmir, I, there's there's so many opportunities to connect uh, on GIS and the geospatial side in NOAA. Uh, I put my email in in the chat. Reach out to me. Now, there's a couple of groups that I want to call out. One is called the uh, the, the Biogeography Group, and they do a lot of uh, benthic habitat mapping and some really cool geospatial modeling. There's the Coast and Geodetic Survey that produces all of the uh, bathymetric maps that are used in the US EEZ. Um, oh gosh, there's there's all going to be all kinds of applications. Ocean Exploration, uh, National Geodetic Survey that, uh, I mean, it's all, almost everything geospatial is tied in some way, shape, or form to what they produce and the, the modeling and mapping of the geoid. So, reach out to me and I'll be happy to give you some specific suggestions um, and maybe ideas about who to connect with. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Kashmir, just something really quick. Uh, NOAA, uh, among all the federal agencies, I would say that NOAA is one of the biggest, uh, most wonderful users of GIS, uh, as, as Russ has uh, expressed. They have a geo platform, which also gives you a, a very nice overview of all the different things they're doing. So I'll put a, a link to that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question, Kashmir. Now, Miguel, no pressure, man, but you are gonna be the grand finale question of this discussion. <laughs> awesome, okay. First off, I wanna thank everybody for being here and it's been really very, very informational and helpful uh, with my, all my notes here that I have spread out. Um, so thank y'all for being here. Um, so my question is, is like a master's versus PhD. So like I'm in my master's right now, uh, second semester, IT, ITA at the same time, and I'm a, a pluvial geomorphology student. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm into, but using geophysics as a tool to uh, image uh, soil structures of point bars and scroll bars. So I like doing like research and I want to continue doing that into my career. Um, my first plan was to be, you know, go to my PhD and then actually be a professor one day and, and, and teach. So that was my first plan, but I kind of strayed away from that a little bit. And I still want to do research, but I kind of wanted to do it in the industry more or less than, uh, than at in academia. So my question is, is what's the benefits of doing masters versus PhDs and uh, for research positions in the industry? And what are kind of some uh, positions or companies that uh, offer us to do like groundbreaking kind of research and that's kind of what you focus towards. That's a, a great question. I'll, I'll dive in really quickly in our remaining moments. Uh, my Sorry about my phone because I've got another call coming up. Uh, I think you can uh, do a, a lot of wonderful research with both a master or a PhD. Uh, on the industry side, just using Esri as an example, one part of our business that a lot of people are not aware of is our environmental consulting firm and our ability to customize our, our software, but also to work just like any other environmental consulting work, a firm on fluvial geomorphology projects, on uh, sea level rise uh, mitigation, all of these take uh, fantastic uh, research uh, efforts. And we have uh, most of the master degree uh, earning staff are in this division. So you can do a, a lot with, with a master degree, even in terms of going to sea and doing uh, oceanographic research. Uh, when I was working for ODP, uh, the master degree was what I needed in order to be a marine technician and was involved in tons of wonderful uh, research there as well. I tend to look at the, uh, the doctoral degree as more of a pure research degree. 
And uh, it, the, the doctoral degree now is taking people in all kinds of different directions as well, including in the nonprofit uh, conservation sector. Uh, but uh, the, the master degree is, uh, I think it's like the Swiss army knife uh, for, for doing uh, all kinds of wonderful things. Now, of course, PhD can be that as well, but I think you're on a good track with the, with the master degree, especially if that is what you want, because the other part of this is what ignites your, your passion and uh, do you want to be, uh, for my PhD, I had to be rather monastic for about five years and just, you know, it was a slog. It was worth it, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's why it's called piled higher and deeper uh, as well <laughs> as a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, agree with everything that, um, that Don said. There's a lot of opportunities for, uh, for the master's degree. I have a master's degree. Um, and I mean, you can do research with that master's degree pretty much in just about any um, geoscience area and in most industries, you can find opportunities at your uh, state, state government level, at the federal government level that are open for master's degrees. Um, the, environmental, the environmental area is big for master's degrees. I mean, it's across the board, actually. I don't even know why I'm talking about specific things. It's across the board, really. Um, and there's some resources at AGI that show that very specifically. Um, so I recommend looking at that if you want more information, um, and something that may come up, like it, it will help you kind of figure out where you might want to go with your research. If you, if you start, um, start in a career somewhere, do some research, figure out what you like, what you don't like, and it might lead you to the doctorate and they might pay for it. Um, so there's some benefits towards, um, going, going into the workforce for a little bit before heading into the PhD, if you're unsure. Can I jump in super quick? I know I'm kind of late to this game. Hi, Debbie. It's been a long Hi. time since I've seen you. Um, but I actually got a master's and then worked for five years and then came to Texas A&M to get my PhD because I knew at that point, and I work in environmental consulting. I have for 16 years now. So, um, but while I was doing my PhD, I had much better focus because I had been working. So I knew what a job was really like. And so you, I also then could say, okay, this is what I'm interested in studying. This is what I want to know about. And it's, and honestly, unfortunately, it's nothing that I do now, <laughs> but um, it was something that I just wanted to be able to do. And so um from an environmental, I mean, I'm, I work for a small firm, um, but we are constantly looking for new grads and that kind of thing. Hint, hint, EarthCon, EarthCon.com, call me. Put it um, in the chat, put it in the chat. I will, I will. Um, but it's, we're looking for new grads. We love undergrads, we love master students, we love PhD students, um, but we don't do the research that you're probably looking for because our clients, pay us to do a specific job. They don't pay us to do research, right? Um, but having that, having worked and, and then deciding to go and do a PhD, I think was um, something that really, it made me much more focused and, um, you know, just kind of pushed me to, to make sure that I was moving forward. Thank you, Julia. Uh, so. Thank you so much. I don't mean to cut you off, but no, I, want, okay. I, I don't want to lose the chance to thank our amazing panelists before they have to depart. Um, so please, everyone, unmute and join me in thanking our four amazing panelists, as well as our hostess with the mostest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. everybody. Thank you. It was super. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your time. Very helpful. And please stick around if you want to continue the conversation. Um, and this will be recorded and made available. All the chat, valuable resources in the chat. Don, Carolyn, Ron, Russell, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Happy to play. Uh, I, I am going to have to bail, though. Yeah. Same here. Gig'em. <laughs>